Institute of Applied Arts Vienna. I welcome you to this start by quoting Frederick Kiesler. A definition of needs has today become of prime importance to the designer of technological environment. Investigation on this crucial point cannot be based upon the study of architecture, but must be based upon the study of man. And it was a great pleasure for us, for the Friedrich Kiesler Foundation Vienna, to organize this uh, meeting, this panel discussion this, e this afternoon. Because after the first impression, I was over there at the Giardini area, and as the most of us has the impression that there all the pavilions and all the shows are more retro, are more historic, and have not the views in the future, have no, the most of them, no vision, no futuristic approach for our society, for art, and for architecture. So I, I, we are really uh, happy especially the university as an institution of research, of development, of new ideas and futuristic approaches is together with us, the Livian and Friedrich Kiesler Foundation, to do, to, do, to do this. Because just Friedrich Kiesler was a person very multi-talented. He was not only an artist, he was also an architect, he was a designer, he was a teacher and always he has endless ideas, as he wants to realize always with his endless house, with his theories, with his models he was developing. So I think he can be a model for, as well, our institution work as for the university, future development, teaching, exhibition making. And I'm very glad that our president, Ani Rashid, and President of the University of Applied Arts, Gerald Bast, and all together the very uh, brilliant board will discuss these topics for the future and not for the past, because I think all has to develop. So thank you and have a really nice and interesting discussion this afternoon. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. When we uh, thought about uh, the panel for this discussion, we were thinking about inviting uh, people that come, let's say, from different um, disciplines. And uh, before I go and introduce the introduce the members of the panel as individuals, uh, it is uh, two theorists on my right, uh, artists that also work in the scale of architecture to my left and there is one proper architect on the very left. Uh, but the proper architect when he was young and still was uh, very much interested and is still young, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> was, <laughs> I'm so sorry, he's younger than I am. <laughs> he was very much interested in the arts and uh, he's one of the few persons where you still feel that this is something that was, uh, let's say, the ground or the basis for his work that he has not lost even in the most uh, commercial circumstances. So, um, we have uh, visual statements by four of the panelists. Uh, um, the, the one on my far right, central Twitter, um, is the only one to not show images. Um, all the others are going to have uh, statements that gives you an impression of uh, either what they have as their favorite vision or utopia from the past, or how their work reflects what Kiesler was standing for. Kiesler was standing for as somebody who invented a certain vocabulary of form that was super influential for what happened in Vienna in the 60s, and Kiesler himself always thought that he was the third generation of modern architects. Well, he belonged to the third generation of modern architects in Vienna. The first, was, first generation was Otto Wagner. 
Uh, the second one was Lewis and Hoffman, and he himself started as being the third generation. And uh, people who became famous as the Austrian New Wave or the Austrian experimental architecture in the 60s, uh, some of them visited Kisler in New York in 1964, one year, that was Abraham and Friedrich St. Florian, one year before he died. And uh, to a certain extent, you could say he handed over the legacy to these people. At least this is what they thought happened when they had this kind of magic meeting. Because to a certain extent, uh, also Kisler is uh, in the vein of Luz, thinking that architecture is something almost sacred. And uh, I think uh, the shrine of the book is something that will uh, feature prominently in the discussion, which is just uh, to the point of what I'm saying. Um, so we have Sanford Pinter, who is a New York-based uh, writer and theorist, a co-founder of uh, Sonos, and uh, he currently teaches at uh, Harvard GSD, but uh, he is going to change uh, his, uh, let's say, locale of action and is, uh, I'm very happy to say, the new professor for architectural theory at the University of uh, Applied Arts in Vienna. Like uh, him, uh, Sylvia Levin, who is head of the PhD in architecture program and professor of architectural history and theory at UCLA, um, he is, or she, is a writer, a theorist, and a curator at the same time. So, uh, you, you put this theory, um, you put this into text, but you also put this into visual presence as uh, exhibitions, which is three disciplines that uh, not many people um, command um, at the same time. To my left is Erwin Burr. Um, I could say one of the most famous artists that Austria has at the moment. He lives and works in Vienna and Lower Austria and works in a multitude of media and also uses a lot of architecture in terms of quotes and in terms of uh, scale. Maybe you've seen um, the house that was presented uh, two years ago at the Biennale, uh, close to the wooden bridge that leads to the academia, which was pretty um, phenomenal, or the house that uh, he put on the Museum of Contemporary Art uh, in Vienna. He was also teaching at the University of Applied Arts between 2002 and 2010. <coughs> um, next to him we have Thomas Saracino, who is a performance and installation artist from Argentina, who lives and works in Berlin, and uh, one of the say the works um, or installations that uh, might stick in your memory most uh, was called Cloud Cities and uh, I think he works pretty close to what Kiesler was intending. Um, Rector Bast said uh, where he quoted Kiesler with this form doesn't follow function, form follows vision, I repeat it, vision follows reality. He also said um, that the reality of it for a designer is not a geometrical description of an object, but the forces that the object emanates. So that is a totally different thing of how you would describe reality. And Thomas, if you ever saw his work and you were, you were dancing in one of his nets that he spans um, across large rooms, you will know what I'm talking about. Finally, we have um, um, Henny Rashid, who since two years, who is uh, co-founder and principal of uh, um, Asymptote Architecture in New York, a company that was founded in, 18, uh, in 1989. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm old enough to mix up things. And uh, he, which he did together with Lisa Couture, and since 2011, he holds a professorship at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. He's uh, one of the three studio heads. So, uh, is this right? Is this the right way? Okay. 
Um, Sylvia and I have been jockeying a little bit to try and get the second spot rather than the first spot, and I clearly lost. Um, I needed, I had hoped for something a bit specific to be already on the table before I brought my general um, reflections on Kiesler uh, to bear on, let's say, the conversation that we hope to have. Um, what I, ha I haven't really prepared anything specific. I have a framework that I was going to use to inflect and to respond to some of the papers that I had heard. So what I will try to do now is to try and transform this framework into something that will stick in your head. Um, my idea really was that the one idea of Kiesler that I found, well, endlessness without a doubt is the interesting and probably the most important idea, but also one of the most opaque and difficult that Kiesler brought, in a way, into architectural thought, history, and discourse. It is, uh, for me, and what I'd like to develop today, it is based on uh, an idea he developed in 1939, I believe, and developed a second time in 1949, so it was definitely in those years of the 40s, the concept of co-realism. And I guess we're in the habit today of quoting him, so I think this is a quote from him. Um, it was, he defined co-realism as the dynamics of continual interaction between man and his natural and technical or technological environments. Now, I'm not going to keep reading that slowly, but I wanted to emphasize virtually every single word in that phrase. Um, and one could really do an entire panel discussion on each one. The ones I'm going to select to emphasize within that are interaction and environments. Now, this idea of Kiesler um, was always intended to connect the idea of endlessness was intended to connect architecture to what we can very generally call the biological, let's say, stratum of culture, society, and even uh, you know, the, the intercourse of, uh, of life. He used a word called biotechnique, but it is important to just situate it. I realize I'm going on, I don't know, I've got a seven or eight minute uh, time to talk here. So uh, it was situated in the work, of, or drawn from the work of Lewis Mumford, who very famously in his work, Technics and Civilization, carved the history of human technics into three distinct eras, the Eotechnic era of the Middle Ages, the paleotechnic era of the, that is associated with the industrial revolution, machines, steam power, the mines, etc., and then the neotechnic era, which is often associated with the great efflorescence of the modern uh, period in the 20th century. But near the end of his book, uh, which is very rarely, um, it's very rarely seized upon by historians, is, is the fourth era that he, that he identified as the biotechnic era, which he could already see back in 1938 as beginning to rise up on the horizon of the 20th century. And this is really where the concept uh, comes from. The endlessness idea, and I was very happy to see finally the house, uh, and therefore the architectural component, finally erased or suppressed from the equation, because that really was part of what Kiesler was aiming at, uh, without being able to articulate it as such, is to, in, sense, in a sense, reconceive of a continuum that did not at any point really even recognize, if you like, the autonomy uh, of objects. And it is the anti-autonomy which is, uh, in a way, so important. The renunciation, in a way, is very similar to what occurs 
when we begin in the 19th century to think in thermodynamic terms, where we begin to realize that the behaviors of any system can be understood only once we decide where the boundary of that system is going to be described or accepted to be. And that has taught us in many ways to begin to believe in the boundary which actually does not exist. The boundary is eminently and indefinitely movable. It actually doesn't exist at all. Everything that takes place in the world actually is in a state of intimate connection and interaction, and I'm talking about just even processes of heat, information flow, etc., with all others. So it's an important thing to begin to see that these boundary problems, which were so important in a way in the 20th century, actually did come in people like Kiesler to be uh, established. Now, I would say that to make a point, always nice to make a little provocation. It's exactly the opposite, it seems, than what was being developed in the fundamentals show today, or, uh, these days. I would say that there is, from the respects, from, with respect to the developments that one could say are foundational in our society and culture, especially through the 20th century into the 21st, there is probably no more absurd idea than going back to reestablish these old autonomies, let's say, of these elements, for example, and these fundamentals. There could be nothing less Kieslerian, for example, than the gesture um, over in the Giardini. Well, ecology is the ultimate expression of these ideas of endlessness. Um, and the concept of the environment as it is posited in Kiesler, is such an important one precisely for that reason, and that is the context in which it has to be understood. So my idea was actually to try and, uh, through a kind of a provocation and example, to talk about something that I found, one, I brought one example in today, and that was talk about food, and the way our understanding and thinking and practice of food is undergoing such profound conceptual even epistemological and ontological. I mean, really, food is where it, or in some ways, the pulse of what is actually happening today in a system of knowledge is, um, uh, can be found. Now, there's perhaps an, a level that has already become a cliche in that area, but I wanted to cite a book that has just come out in the United States. It's called The Third Plate. And it's by Dan Barber. Only Americans will perhaps know Dan Barber. He is one, he is one of the very influential chefs in America. Um, he runs a, a red restaurant in New York called Blue, Blue Hill. Um, and they have a small farm actually in northern New York where they grow uh, and raise animals. And they grow many of their vegetables, etc. All you need to know is that uh, the, pro the project that he had been embarked on for 20 years came to be known in the United States as the farm to table movement, which in the history of American cuisine, unlike Mediterranean cuisine, for example, uh, was quite a revolution in the way it changed the way we think about how we eat, how we prepare food, what food is, and how it represents our immediate environment, everything from regionality to local uh, sourcing to organic uh, and heritage-based uh, uh, procurement and development of the materials of the kitchen and their organization and redesign, if you like, and their presentation, if you like, at the table, and then the ways in which they are supposed to ultimately affect us and transform us cognitively and on every other level also change our body uh, states, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So in a sense, the farm to table movement, which is not what I'm talking about today, I just want you to know that in case you think that that's what I'm going to be celebrating, it isn't, um, was in a way the, introduced the, a new type of consciousness, if you like, a new type of ecological consciousness, a new type of um, environmental consciousness, but one that was always technical. It always had a very profound technical basis. Uh, and it's very important to understand that why cooking is important for that reason, because it does have an enormous technological component. 
Um, and it is also a technics, and it is a biotechnics, of course, as well, in the sense that it does relate, of course, to, to the evolution of our own biologies, etc. Now, we can get into many areas of that, but I really want to point out simply, I want to lay down these basic ideas of Barber, because I believe they are indicative in many ways and representative of a very profound transformation that's taking place today in how we understand the relationship between what we do and the place in the world uh, that we do it in. What he came to understand in the last few years, and that's what the third plate is all about, the second plate in history is the farm to table uh, movement. He begins to realize that this is a kind of grotesque um, misplacement of the boundary. The idea of simple cherry picking of the finest ingredients and the abandoning in some ways of all of the other associated ones, all the parts, for example, of the lamb, which do not represent the, the, the you know, the, the choice uh, appearance uh, at the table, uh, the costs, both technological, energetic, ecological, of raising these super high quality organic um, uh, vegetables, etc. He posits another idea, the third table, because he wants to understand what food is going to be like in the future. Um, and it's also what I would suggest is what architecture will be like in the future. And his idea, very simply, is he tries to understand how to approach what he calls a whole system, a, uh, which he calls a whole system of agriculture which includes, in fact, a profound understanding of the dynamics of soil, of land, of the sea, and of seed, in its, in its, in its also in its biological uh, context. And um, the idea is that the table, the menu, is to be structured and modeled, or is modeled on the structure and movements um, I had these rough notes, give me a second here, I want to get this sentence down right. Um, oh yes, the, the, uh, the point is to model the structure and movements of the table or the menu or the meal on the structures that we have now begun to seek and to discover in the environment itself. Yeah. All right, I'll leave it off there because the next presentation was uh, meant. I'll tell you, for those who know what it is, I wanted to talk, I was going to talk about the, the he, he, he emphasizes the Dehisa pastoral management system of the Iberian Peninsula, which some people know about this, but the important thing about it, I just want to tell you what it is. Uh, in Wiki, if you look it up in Wikipedia, the phrase they used is a multifunctional agro silvo meaning forest, pastoral system, and cultural landscape. The only important thing to understand here is that it's this extraordinary model evolved over five, six hundred years in which wildlife, um, uh, livestock, agriculture all take place in an incredibly uh, 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 harmonic uh, uh, environment where the acorns produce the specific qualities of the flesh of the boars that eat the pigs that eat it, etc., which creates this remarkable jamón uh, um, uh, uh, in Spain, the hams, the, and the cork, which is harvested from the oaks, which are very carefully cultivated. Uh, actually have an extraordinary role playing in sequestering carbon during the time when they're replacing their bark, etc., etc. And it goes on and on. It happens to be one of the harshest environments in Europe, and it is one of the most biodiverse places on Earth. Thank you. share a table with, uh, share the stage with children, animals, and Sanford Quinter. 
Um, yes. Okay, you, you can do that. So um, I just would like to thank uh, Dr. Boss for having me and um, say hello to so many friendly faces out there uh, in the audience. And just to say, um, I'm, I'm very glad to be sitting down in what I think is the coolest room here in the Arsenal. Yes, after, after a long, long, what seems like endless walk down here. And um, it was as I was finding my way along this endless route, um, I thought to myself, there is something, another form of endlessness with which we might associate Kiesler, which is the endlessness of the outsider. Um, there is, of course, a geopolitics to the layout of the Arsenale, and we are very, very far away. And uh, Kiesler stands for that farness and for uh, a kind of thinking that I think is particularly appropriate um, to raise today, given all of the new centers um, that we are looking at across, uh, across in the other pavilions. So let's say in a kind of shorthand, this, we might think of uh, uh, Kiesler as a stand-in for the Salon des Refusés, and a salon that I hope is endless in the work that it might have to do to think, uh, to help us think about the future. Um, so one thing that I just wanted to say is, um, as a kind of uh, super um, reductive preliminary, um, I think that we were asked to talk about utopia uh, today. I, mean, I don't know whether that was get told to you all, but we were told to uh, talk about utopia. <coughs> Um, and I thought, wow, that's a, that's, a, that's a great and big word. Um, but So let's just say for the, for the sake of argument today, on this day, in this context, uh, utopia for me is going to stand for uh, the refusal of cynicism. Um, okay. So um, we've been asked, not today, but over the last few days, to look back over the last hundred years and to go back to 1914. And if you're on the quest for endless outsiders, of course, the classic outsider is Duchamp. And there is a kind of history of modernism, ironically, a pretty well-known history of modernism that is also not at all part of the presentation of the history of modernism that we have been looking at across the way. So we've been looking at uh, a proliferating number of stories about uh, the same central history of modernism. So we might think about the history of the avant-garde as another aspect of, another fundamental, if you will, of the history of modernism, one that seems to need to be brought back into the, uh, onto the table. So if we go back to the teens and we think of Duchamp, uh, you know, Duchamp is, I suppose, the alter ego in some way, not of Rose de la Vie, but of Kiesler, um, the endless uh, creator of uh, the outside. I did, it did make me think, um, I wish that urinal, that incredible urinal, my favorite object in the fundamentals, that 18th century Rococo urinal, I just keep thinking, what would Duchamp have done with that urinal? Um, but uh, to, to your point, we might say that Duchamp was already um, uh, produced art without being an artist and already revealed the absurdity of uh, removing fundamental things like toilets from their biotechnological uh, apparatus. Um, so, uh, but to move on to Kiesler in some weird way, um, do you just like. Just one second. So, so, um, so you know this Man Ray photograph of the large glass. You know it well. You know that the painting was uh, the, the large glass was on its side and it accumulated dust uh, for a year, which is to say, it accumulated and became the index of the entropic decay of bodies and buildings as they shed pieces of themselves and find new surfaces to stick on. So we might say that this accidental reporting of the unfolding of the biotechnological life of the modern subject uh, became a kind of accidental way to invent a new city plan, a new diagram for how the, another future of modernism was going to unfold. Um, what you may or may not know is that after this photograph was taken, Duchamp cleaned half the dust off and fixed the other half of the dust 
so that the accident itself became part of this story. Um, so I started to think, well, where is the history of this dust and its possibilities in the history of uh, modern architecture that we might think of as belonging to the worldview of Kiesler? And my mind went immediately to Alison Knowles, uh, one of the founding members of Fluxus, who wrote a poem using an early computer um, in the 1960s called The House of Dust. And one of the things that I think is also very important about this poem is not just this incredible delivery system, it was generated by the computer, it was delivered in helicopter and dropped from above like goodies during World War II, talk about food and its technological distribution uh, system. Uh, here we had Fluxus poems that, that came out of the sky, uh, um, etc. But then this house was actually built and it moved around. It was first in New York and then it went to, to CalArts, etc. And here you see a Fluxus event happening uh, on the inside. I think I have another, another picture. Um, so this house is not endless in the way the Kiesler house is. Um, it doesn't have, uh, it does have a flat bottom. It has, it has a kind of architecture that is perhaps uh, less perfectly uh, circular in its, in its logic. But on the other hand, its relationship to the computer-generated poem, the fact that it is in fact not made out of dust, but made out of dust becomes something else. In other words, uh, a system of exchange of materials um, is part of its potential, uh, uh, is part of its potential endlessness. Of course, this is really just a way we can continue the quest for dust, which would be to say the quest for another kind of uh, exclusion from not only the history of modernism that we generally know, but the history of modernism that we're being told uh, again and again. Um, uh, a new form of uh, interest in hygiene and the ecological. I'm sure you all know this project uh, by, by Francois Roche that is about dust that uses electromagnetism and other things to collect the dust that Duchamp, all he needed was uh, gravity and a little bit of time. And uh, today we have, uh, you know, gravity doesn't work by itself. We need to help gravity along. We're part of a much more complex system. And this produces a kind of strange sort of utopia, if you will. It cleans the air. It's a self-cleaning machine. It cleans the air of the dust inside and uses the dust as a building material, which theoretically will get more and more solid uh, as the world uh, as the world unfolds. I, I think um, because you didn't end with architecture, and because there is a kind of rejection of the realities of architecture, I will just end with one sort of obvious problem that this building uh, suggests and perhaps relates to a problem uh, that is endlessly unresolved in Kiesler, uh, which is to say, how the hell do you put a door in a, something like that, right? This is a really fundamental problem. All those doors, they're really easy to put into square buildings. Um, they are not so easy to put into buildings that are always growing and made out of dust. For, and if for even just a moment you ask yourself how you enter a dust building that has no door, and you imagine what would happen to your body as you entered, I think that the idea of isolating architecture from its co-realistic uh, tentacles into the new biotechnical reality would be a myth that would uh, come to an end. Thank you. You focus that. It's two little houses and um, sausages. It's an, an Austrian uh, sausage which is called Frankfurter. In Germany they call it Wienerlin, which relates Vienna to Frankfurt, to Germany, and Germany to Vienna, to Austria. And the other one is called, it's a knacker. That's a specific sausage, it's a bit thicker. And um, sausage, of course, is the skin of the sausage. The basic sausage is intestines. And uh, we all have intestines inside. So what I wanted to say is, when I think about Kiesler, I always think about how would he, how would he um, progress with his work 
let's say, if you would lived, would have lived for 500 years. Probably going towards the direction to build houses as biological forms, as living forms, means uh, all these things, all his endless house, when you look at it, it reminds me always to, to my butcher, because I see all these things there. It reminds me also to Hermann Nietzsche in a way, and to things which are related to intestines, to body, inside, outside, skin, volume, mass, basic structural questions on the one side and on the other side, biological issues. So I think, and I'm working also on this idea to create a house which is constructed biologically, means which lives. And um, for example, you live in this house and you want to have another room because you, got a ch you get a child or two, or two children, the house is growing another room. Makes it makes a part here or makes a part there. So the house itself would grow. And, uh, construct the, the living form of or the apartments or uh, whatever, or the, 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 the garages or so on. So um, let's go back to the sausage. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I thought uh, just to show one work, which I think is somehow uh, related with Kisler, and, uh, and maybe also make a comment to. Sorry? Ah, no, no. yes. Uh, and also somehow maybe also make a comment also of the struggle that I was yesterday when I saw the Giardini. And I thought also about, like, uh, you know, once again, I mean, uh, also to put it in the context of what a floor could be, uh, this redundancy of uh, abstracting something which uh, is kind of impossible to define these elementary particles. And in this case also maybe try to weave again some kind of relationship which I think so maybe it may, but uh, maybe what I try to do is kind of uh, uh, describe a little bit the work which is there, which uh, I don't know if you can see really well, but basically it's like a kind of a... Um, and also, we try to avoid very quickly. Uh, yep. Ah, okay. Um, and like a prejudice, somehow, <laughs> very quickly. This will happen also when, uh, because we have a conference with Bruno Latour then. Even Bruno Latour went to the piece, right? And then the very easy thing is like uh, people have in mind the jumping castle. <laughs> and I have to kill this idea somehow because. Uh, let me put it that way. Uh, well, we go through some of the images, right? I mean, it's, it's a very room, it's a big room, which is a pressure guys, right? And there is air inside. This means the first things every time that people open the door in the lower level, people in the upper level kind of modify also the position, right? But, but what I want to tell you is one thing. When you are in a jumping castle, it's like a high pressure ice. There is a lot of tension, thing, and you might be able to jump. When even Bruno was up there, right, and we had a conference, and he kept the idea of the memory that you will be able to jump. What I'm telling you here, this is impossible to jump. Uh, no, it's like it is. And then he gave like a, one of the last gift or lecture about the relationship of how was our relationship of planetary boundary and, and how we are stick to the planet Earth. You know, it's a sublunar idea. This means, uh, once again, it's a huge volume of air. This means when I move, you would be moving in the back, but after a while, it's kind of uh, being kind of in a C, uh, a little B. This means there is a kind of a, a extended butterfly effect, uh, but it takes uh, some time. Unless we somehow, you know, everybody could say, well, before everybody from the planet Earth jump at the same time, we might change the angle of the degree of the Earth. But, uh, but this is very rare, you could. Um, I mean, that's one thing which I'm trying right away try to, to, to to take it out from that. And the other one is, again, uh, with this idea of this floor, right? This means, uh, once again, uh, you have to think that, uh, let me see if I have a drawing somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. This means, uh, uh, you know, also for the idea of the endless house, no? It's like 
you know, so how complicated it is, I mean, what you will call this is a floor, who became a wall, and it's a space that doesn't exist until you don't transit the space, right? This means, once again, it's uh, you know, very simple to explain, maybe with a theory related to Einstein, right? Space is curved with the mass of your body. This means, basically, this is a lasagna. There are three layers, which are squeezed one to each other, and then when you enter into the space, you open the space. This means space does not exist until you don't access to it. And at the same time, space follows you. And at the same time, you know, what, what you could say uh, is very much codependent on the people which are in the upper layer. This means uh, at the same time that you can open your space, but if there are people in the upper space also, uh, it closes again. This means, once again, what I was thinking is like, if, you know, um, if you, if you have to describe what is this, you know, the first problem which I encountered is like, well, is a, is a floor, is a ceiling, is a wall, uh, I don't know. And then somehow I love to kind of uh, relate with Kisler also. And at the same time also, um, I don't know, when Sam also was talking about uh, ecology, right? I love, you know, uh, Felix Batari when he talked about the three ecology, right? Or how sustainable might be an environment. And you know, it's not only about, you know, well, all the time now getting you know, this kind of environmental ecology, but Felix Batari talked also, he talked about uh, social ecology and the mental ecology. This means one of the things which, uh, 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 and also, uh, yesterday I was talking a little bit about the whole, right? The, uh, the person who invented the term proxenia. This is the, the piece, what it does really is also, it, uh, it measures the ability to, to get close one to each other, right? Besides kind of, uh, give like kind of a social coherence of, uh, of how we might repercute one to each other, but also without knowing, because remember, every time you open the door, uh, this kind of ecosystem that you kind of learn to navigate it, uh, it kind of collapse again. And the other thing also is like how close I can get one to each other. If we, and, and also, uh, let me put it up, it's, it's more than nice. <laughs> But if we get too close, and visitors get too close, if the space, it falls too much, and everybody starts to collapse in kind of this social black hole somehow. <laughs> which, um, which for me is, is quite interesting. Um, what else I have to say? Um, well, uh, hmm? that, that's it, okay, thank you. <laughs> Just, just before we start, uh, one, of, one of the things that's fascinating about this panel, um, and it's kind of interesting to look at it from this point of view, is that in a way, if you were to dissect uh, Kiesler's psyche and, uh, and sort of mentality and his kind of progression through the work, you probably would dissect it into these at least four or five parts. <laughs> An obsession with food, uh, an obs uh, obsession with the biological house, the dust house, um, uh, there's a number of things here that are, that are themes that are extraordinary. And it's, when you think about it, the Frederick Kiesler had this all sort of swirling around in his head at the same time. It's kind of an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary man in an extraordinary time. Um, I just wanted to also announce one of the nice things about this panel also is probably it is the first panel, I think, um, that we're doing a, a jubilee year next year. Uh, 2015 is the uh, 50th anniversary of the death of Frederick Kiesler, the 150th of his birth and the 50th of the Shrine of the Book in Jerusalem. So it's a kind of a very important year. Um, and this probably is the first panel um, in, in, that, uh, in, that, in that legacy, in that year of celebration, which will include hopefully uh, an exhibition using modern art as well as... Um, as far as my lowly position as an architect, uh, working in this, in this kind of atmosphere of Kiesler, um, I've been working on a project that I kind of realize now for um, I'm 15 years now of work in a similar, same kind of project, this kind of infinite project that I'm, I'm involved in, aside from the commercial work, the uh, teaching, the uh, running of, the, of the, um, the foundation, other things that I do. Um, and this statement by Kiesler in his uh, Pseudo-Functionalism um, uh, in Modern Architecture 1949 book uh, is, is to me something that is, is, uh, is uh, sort of, you know, uh, desperately uh, missing in, in, in the fundamental argument. Um, but essentially, uh, you know, the box construction in keeping with practice of living in houses of volume in which people live polydimensionally, it is a sum of every possible movement that its inhabitants can make within it, and these movements are infused with a flux of instinct. Um, the project for me that I didn't realize really was tied to Kiesner until I became more involved in, in, in the foundation and in the history of the work. But, you know, I started uh, very early on with a computer trying to figure out how to make sketches. I thought one of the things that really the computer should allow us to do as architects, as artists, as thinkers, 
um, as, as is to actually make drawings that are digitally manifest, um, and, and in fact, what would that mean? And the time dimension is part of that, the organic dimension is part of that. Uh, and this was a sketch, computer sketch, I guess you could call it, a computer drawing that I did in 1918, uh, <laughs> 96 maybe, or 97. Um, and uh, it was really a kind of a, an attempt to, uh, to, to you know, meta put together, um, in fact, I used as a, as a basis for this protective armor and sport, um, and said, you know, could we in fact create a kind of fluid, dynamic, liquid architectural space uh, by, by, in fact, uh, morphing together all these sort of, um, um, sort of protective gear in the sport um, situation. Um, back here in the Biennale in 2000, I shared the American Pavilion, it was 2000 with Greg Lynn. Uh, Greg and I had two halves of the American Pavilion, and in my half, uh, we did a couple of experiments. Uh, one was um, uh, with the students from Columbia University. We did these kind of studies of motion, motion graphics, and motion um, sort of mapping to see what, in fact, the human body could map as far as an architectural and uh, environmental space. Um, we went on to produce in the American Pavilion. Uh, this is, uh, you know, I guess we're looking at 15 years now. Um, a project where uh, we had an actual acrobat come into the space, the American Pavilion produce a, a sort of acrobatic move, a, a sort of somersault, uh, and then digitally map the somersault with the puppeteering um, you know, um, sort of uh, mechanisms on her body, and as a result produced a kind of fluid, um, uh, endless space. Uh, and again, this was this was with Kiesler's ghost in the mix, but but Kiesler wasn't really at the forefront of, this, of, this, of the reason of doing this. The reason for doing this was, in fact, to use the computer again to develop uh, sketches, uh, theories, conceptual uh, basis for producing uh, spatial works. Uh, and this was the construction that we actually had Venetian boat builders built here uh, in the American Pavilion uh, almost 15 years ago. Um, in my own uh, sort of studies, then, a whole set of drawings, I'm not going to show them all, but we did, we did uh, countless drawings. Uh, looking at the use of computer graphics, computer simulation, and software, early software. This is Soft Image in 19, almost, uh, this is 1999, 98, um, and, uh, and producing a series of, of graphic works. And then there was a kind of breakthrough work, for me at least, uh, which was the deformation of auto bodies into, into kind of anatomical works that somehow deal with the human body. Now, again, in the Kiesler kind of spirit, I guess this notion of this kind of pseudo sexual. Uh, strangely uh, organic, infinite looping um, thing that I produced just by virtue of automotive uh, dissection um, is really interesting to me and continues to evolve and, and has been a project that has been going on uh, in the Biennale here again. And the Biennale has become a kind of a place. And one of the arguments I would make about the Biennale in general and what's been happening to it um, is that it really is the fervent place, at least for architects and for artists, to. Uh, produce polemical, interesting, discursive experiments. So when you don't do that, um, I don't think you're using the place uh, in, in the best way. Um, this was our investments Biennale, um, and we produced what I called a, a, a light, um, a sort of a slight simulator tunnel, and we took these objects, this kind of strange form that I just showed you, and put it on a light table and had it metamorph and change according to uh, both uh, reflective uh, one-way mirrors and, and moving light, but no computer simulation. Graphics, uh, but in actual space. And the idea was to see, in fact, this object in real time, real space, and see how it evolved. From that, a series of objects um, that were created uh, and, and continue to be involved and created, and, and looking now at creating these as robotic objects that actually can change uh, according to different criteria. One of them was this thing called the Baldacan that was commissioned work uh, for, a, for a private bedroom. Um, and that became, uh, and I know exactly when this was because my son there is very young, <laughs> so it's a while, um, and it became a kind of a full-scale installation piece. And again, the spirit of, of Kiesler and play and, and, uh, and, and the body, uh, kind of, and, and Thomas's case, uh, in a kind of organic space that, that became a clearly interesting experiment. It became then, and this is just to wrap it up, uh, a house commission, um, and it was actually a commission that came from a collector, an art collector in Finland, who happens to be very involved with architecture, and so we've been on a quest now to actually build a house uh, for this collector, and we've been looking at the house as kind of an object that could fit on different landscapes. And we began, we began to plan a, a sort of a home inside one of these objects, um, and a home that in fact has no level floors, uh, but in fact has a fluid flowing into a space that moves around to can a cantilever form and a bridge form. It's essentially, it's called a wing house. 
Um, it's in development, it's a continual quest, it's, uh, it's about to all kinds of different people involved in trying to figure out whether or not we can actually construct this thing. Um, but effectively, at the end of the day, what, what it is right now is a container with four light uh, vessels, that, in fact, uh, light the interiors, no, no parallel floors or no level floors, and the bedrooms between the children and the parents and the various uses are all, all fluid and flow into this kind of infinite, almost uh, Mobius strip loop. Um, to, uh, I don't know if it's actually a sausage, but uh, the fact is that it, it, it does change and flow, at least metaphysically or, or in terms of, the, of what one's use of the um, So we've been, we've been moving along uh, on this project. Um, these are some of the spaces that are beginning to get carved out of it. And at the end, um, the site of it, the, the site that we're looking at in Finland, uh, the site where the house will sort of perch itself uh, on, on a mountain top. When, but as I said, it's an infinite project. Chances are it'll metamorph again to something else, and it'll never really.